is the God of hope. He's a God of restoration. And his arms are open wide for you to experience all that he is today. If God did it then, our God can do it again now. You may think it's over. Others may say it's over. But with our lives in God's hands, it is not over. The love of Jesus liberates our souls, steadies our feet, and gives us a hope that can never be taken away. Come on, can we stand to our feet today? Quick question before we start into this time of worship, Arthur, and I know I ask it a lot. But I just want to try to wake up our souls this morning and remind us of why we live to begin with. Because we are created to what? Worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Are there any worshipers in church today on a Sunday morning? Come on now. to the night wanting a place to hide this weary soul this bag of bones oh I try with all my might but I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting a bag of bones And just when I ran out road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. Come on, it's a testimony, sing. He picked me up, he turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior. Say, I thank God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends Burr and bitterness You can't just keep it moving You ain't welcome here From now till I walk the streets of gold I sing about you, say my soul This wayward son has found its way back Because he healed my heart, he changed my name, forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, say, I thank God. Oh, I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord. Oh, I thank God. Oh, sing it up.
grateful that God brought them from a dark place. We're going to call dead things to life today. Yeah. We sing, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. We sing, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. We say get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Because he picked me up, he turned me around and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name, forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God.
sorrow and dead in my sins Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty redeemed my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Come on, church, sing it out. Oil makes so free, washes up. I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore Yeah, he canceled my debt And he called me his friend rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand when death was arrested my life began oh your grace oh your grace
the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was a rest, my life be. Yes, we're free, free forever. We're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free. Forever, amen. When death was a rest, and my life began. Come on, let the redeemed of the Lord lift up their praise to the Father. Woo. Come on, somebody say, Woo! Sometimes you just gotta. Man, are you happy you're in God's house on a Sunday morning? This is the best place you could be, I promise you. I can promise you that. This is the best. Man, you ever just say something, you go, I need to say that five more times in a row. This is the best place you can be in the whole world. Standing shoulder to shoulder with brothers and sisters. Redeemed. I'm not going to apologize for getting excited about all that God's done for me, especially on a Sunday morning in a room with a whole bunch of people that love Jesus. Anyway, we're going to do an offering. Are there any cheerful givers in the house of God today? Come on. It's a cheerful thing. And um, we have a scripture from Luke we're going to read here in a moment. I just want to tell you this real quick. This is a, uh, this is a get-to thing. Mm. We get to show up and worship the Lord. We get here, especially here in this country where we don't really, this is a, this is a total right we have. This is a get to. We get to show up here, stand next to our brothers and sisters and lift our hands and thank God for redeeming us, and saving us, giving us a new life. Mm. And uh, we get to worship and we get to give an offering and a tithe. And we're going to read the scripture together, give and it will be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for for with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you isn't that good yeah. can we just pray for our tithe and offering this morning lord thank you so much for the opportunity lord that we don't have to do this this isn't a, a requirement this is a get to thing lord we just get to show up and give you all we have lord we, when you take this tithe and offering, it becomes worship unto you, Lord. So thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We give you all that we have today. And we're so grateful for an opportunity to sow into your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would multiply just like you do all the time in our lives and around the world. You would multiply every dollar given today for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. If you're giving a tithe and offering in the room, there's receptacles in the back of the room. You can place that in there. If you're giving online, there's a link that will direct you on how to give to the Lord today. Can we sing this chorus a couple more times as a church? Oh, your grace so free it washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins. time if you love the Lord today. Yeah.
I'm originally from South Texas, which means we say stuff like, today's only going to get gooder and gooder and gooder. Why don't you turn to somebody, smile real big, show a little teeth, welcome somebody to church today and say, it's going to be a great day. You're in the best place you could be. Amen. And then you can have a seat and make yourself comfortable. everybody. How many is glad you came to church today? Come on, right? It's a good day. Hey, can we welcome everyone joining us online, your church family online? Come on, give them a shout. We love you. Grateful for you. Yeah, you know, I know, I know today's going to get gooder and gooder, but how many just realize that Pastor Nathan just gets gooder and gooder and gooder, doesn't he? Come on. We're grateful for him. Well, guys, really excited about this series that we are embarking on. It's the year of the Bible. And we're going to be engaging our lives with the Word of God over the next year, starting in March, the beginning of March. All of us together are going to go on a journey. And I invite you to be begin to prepare your heart. But before we get to March, I wanted to share with us some things that will position us to come to the Word of God in a fresh way. To come to it in a mentally, emotionally, in a way to know that what we're engaging with is the truth of God's Word. Amen? Come on, amen. amen. And so I want to prepare us. I'm going to prepare you to receive everything that God has for you. And so today, I want to share with you something that's a really special to my heart as we embark on these areas of Scripture beginning in March that are going to be real challenging. It's going to really do a work in our lives. And I don't know about you. Does anyone here have anything in your life you wish wasn't there? Raise your hand. Don't point at her. Don't do that. That was wrong. <laughs> That's funny. And so as we engage with the word of God, it's, gonna, it's going to transform us. We've looked at how we can rely on Scripture because we have the proofs of manuscripts. We've, we've looked at the authority of Scripture. We, we, we've looked at the idea that, that we are, when we come to the Word of God, we're gazing upon God's glory and it's transforming us as it did, jo as it did Moses on, the, on, the, on his face on the outside. It is doing that now on the inside and changing us. But today, I want to share with you something that will really prepare you. Really, it will prepare you in life to receive everything that God has for you. I'm not joking. What I'm sharing with you today, that if you apply it to your life, it will transform every area of your life because it will allow you to be transformed by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. There's something in each of us that can either allow us, and this is what I'm talking about today, allow us to be transformed, or if it's not there, it will hinder us. The something that I'm talking about today, it will, it, it, it will lift us to new places, and we will be able to reap the blessing of God, but without it, we will remain in our current place of maturity, understanding, and blessing. Last week we talked about as we gaze upon the, the glory of God and the word of God that we move from one glory to another glory. We are transformed by God's glory. But if you don't have what I'm talking about today, it's actually not going to work. If we don't have what I believe God wants to deposit in us today... We will continue to be overwhelmed with the fears of the world, overwhelmed with, with our own life, and we're going to miss the peace of God that's available to us in the most difficult of circumstances. Without it, we will become filled with fear. 
With it in our relationship with God, we will flourish and it will lead us to a flourishing relationship, not only with God, but with the people around us in our church, in our families. This message today, it's, it's, uh, it's not for those who want their ears tickled. This is a bit of an elbow in the ribs. I'm just being honest with you. But this message today is for those who want to participate, want to cooperate with God's incredible plan for their lives. And I want to, I want to begin by looking at what Paul tells Timothy. Paul tells Timothy something that is, that's about his cooperation with God's plan. So God has a plan for us. We know that. We see it in Scripture. But it's up to us. It's up to us. Everybody say, it's up to us. If we're going to cooperate with that plan or not. There's a part that we have in this journey with God, in our spiritual development. And so Paul tells Timothy to do something. Paul tells Timothy to... to, to to cooperate with God. And this is, now listen, this is not something that is done for Timothy, but something that Paul tells Timothy, instructs Timothy to do. Yes, in the Christian life, a lot is done. It's that God's salvation is done. He's paid, he's made the way for us. It's done. But there's also something we need to do. And so Paul tells Timothy these words in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, th this is what he says to Timothy. He says this, train yourself for godliness. Read that with me. Train yourself for godliness. Now, when you first look at this, you go, oh, wow, okay, all right. But I, I'm, we're going to lean in a little further with this. But I, I want you to see it in, the, in another translation. The New King James says this, exercise yourself towards godliness. The NIV says, train yourself to be godly. The NASB says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So in our lives, God makes us holy. He justifies us. But we then begin in a sanctification process. And our sanctification is directly connected to our cooperation with the God that we meet in his word. But Paul is saying to Timothy, what God wants to do in your life, Timothy, your potential, Timothy, is going to take your cooperation with God. I mean, think back on your spiritual journey. Any time that you, you think, man, that was a great season of growth. That was a great season of, of God moving in my life. There, there's, there's a common denominator. You were cooperating with God. And that cooperation is difficult at times, isn't it? I think why it's, well, I know why it's so difficult at times because cooperating with God in your own life means you got to, here's, 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 this, here's this word, deny yourself. Yay. <laughs> it's not fun. It's difficult. It's difficult at times. Many scholars believe when Paul is writing this to Timothy, the context that Timothy was fully aware of was the people of Ephesus, where Timothy was, they'd spent a great deal of time and money training athletes for different contests. They had different festivals that would, they'd have races and different competitions. And it was known, they were, they, they were um, within the Greek world, they, they, it, the physical body was a big deal. The athleticism, their performance. But this is why Paul is using this context to say something to Timothy. 
Now, Paul goes on to say in verse 8, he says, For a while, bodily training is of some value. Godliness is of, is of value in every way. So for a while, yeah, okay. It's good that you, listen, you should eat well. You should exercise. You should take care of yourself. But it's just for a while. Because everybody knows this body's got an expiration date, don't we? We don't like to talk about it. But it's true. But look, godliness is of, is of value in every way as it holds promise, now look, for the present life and also for the life to come. So this Greek word, though, that Paul is using to train yourself, exercise, discipline yourself, is that it's the same word that we use, the same, where, where we get our word gymnasium from. So you can see what Paul's saying here to Timothy. Timothy, there is a process in which you're going to need to do and you're going to need to participate. You're going to need to cooperate with God towards godliness. In the NASB, that word is called discipline. Everybody say discipline. So, but what is godliness? Who defines what godliness is? Because we have our own ideas. Okay, but godliness is as godliness is you're nice to people. Godliness, oh, okay, okay, wait, wait. But who are we looking at? Who's our standard? What does that look like? What is Paul telling Timothy to go after godliness? What is that? And the best way to define what it means to be godly would be for us to train, for us to, dis, to, to discipline ourselves, now hear me, to be like Christ. Christ-likeness. The word Christian means little Christ. So when we look to Jesus, we see what it means to be godly. When we come to the scriptures, we see what it means to be godly. And we find Jesus and we look to him and we, we see the character of God manifest in Jesus' life. Hebrews 1.3 says, he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So Jesus is our example. Jesus has lived the life that we couldn't live. He died for us. Because we couldn't die for ourselves. He paid the penalty. And so now we are a part of his family. And Paul tells Timothy, son, listen, I want you to discipline yourself, train yourself, exercise, get into the gym of godliness. This discipline, it's not just the, the desire to be like him, because all of us have a desire, I want to be like Jesus. But to train ourselves to be like him is another story, isn't it? It's another story. To train ourselves not to respond like Jason wants to, but as Christ would. To speak like Christ would, to live like Christ, to serve like Christ, to emulate the actions and the life of Christ, just, just not on Sundays, on Mondays. Discipline yourself. This is the purpose of why we are going to come to the Word of God this year. We're going to gaze upon the glory and radiance of Christ. And we are going to train ourselves to be like Him. And He's given us the, a spirit inside of us, He's delivered us. We, we're no longer bound to sin, we don't have to sin. We're not a slave to sin. We're a servant of Christ now. 
And so we're going to be disciplining, training, exercising to be like Jesus through the reading of his word. The only place, so if you think about Jesus, so what's he like? Well, the only place really that Jesus verbally describes what he's like is in Matthew 11. And this is what he says. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Now, look, look, look at this. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is gentle. And this is what I want to lean into today. He's humble. What would it look like to train yourself in humility? As you read the life of Jesus, his life demonstrates humility. Jesus declared that he is humble in heart. Now, this is very challenging because we see Jesus and, and we're, we're Americans and we're humans. It's interesting. Jesus didn't say, and I'm also powerful, though he is, or I'm influential, and he, he is. He didn't say, come to me all so that I can get the respect that I deserve. Because I'm God in the flesh, y'all. Respect me. This is my position. Come to me. Now. So that you can demonstrate to me that you see me for really who I am. Come to me. Because I just healed seven people. He doesn't say that. He doesn't display that. He never demonstrated. Now listen. He never demonstrated a spirit of entitlement. He says, I'm gentle and I'm humble. He never demonstrates, don't you know that I know all things? Not even to the Pharisees, not even to the, to the, to the stuck-ups of the religious world. He chews them out a couple times. But it wasn't because he was demanding. You better bow, because one day you will, by golly. We think of godliness, and hear me today, friends. We think of godliness as something to be displayed admired, leveraged, marketed. But when you see godliness and you replace that word with Christ-likeness, then godliness is humility. Humility. Over the span of this year in the Bible, you will need a key to unlock God's best for your life. You will need a key that will unlock the word of God, that will activate it in your life, that will begin to transform you and change you. And humility is the key that unlocks God's biblical potential in your life. The growth in your spiritual life in the word of God. Now listen, it's directly connected to the manner in which you come to the word of God. And the manner in which you allow the word of God to speak to you. The reason why you come to the word of God. 
And you will receive, friends, everything. Say everything. So think about this. Here's, here's the key. I got one key. Let's just say I got one key. This one key will unlock everything that God has for you in his word. And it's humility. Listen, we don't, we don't come to the word of God to, to become a better version of ourselves. Trust me, there ain't no version of me that I'm like, yes, that's perfect. None, I promise you. Ask my, ask my family. We come to the word of God to meet with God in the pages of his words for one purpose, to become like Jesus. To become like Jesus. I know a lot of, I know a lot of people, a lot of Bible teachers, preachers, pastors, who know a lot of scripture, but they're arrogant. They're self-righteous. They're mean. They're bitty. They're sharp. They speak of themselves often. Usually the introduction to the word of God is something about them. They often speak of the mysteries that they know of and the mysteries that other people do not know of. They often speak of the spiritual immaturity of others. They often speak as they've arrived at a little club that there are very few people who are in this club. They often speak of themselves. They're easily offended when they're not respected, when they're not heard, when they speak, when the room doesn't stand to attention, when they walk in, they're offended. How can that be? How can teachers of the Word of God and people who read the Word of God and people who know the Word of God, how can they become arrogant? Well, Paul speaks to this, 1 Corinthians 8.1. He says that knowledge... Puffs up. So if a person becomes arrogant by the study of Scripture, then they are not studying the Scriptures to become like Christ, but only to increase in knowledge. That's a big deal. Meaning when they come to the Word of God, they're not coming to it in humility, but for the purpose of using it for themselves selfishly, to either make themselves look better, to make themselves sound better, to make themselves look smarter or sound smarter. Those people, when they, re, when they come to the word of God to seek knowledge, it puffs them up. But when you come to the word of God to become like Christ, it humbles you and transforms your life. Now, this, this idea of using God to advance our, our life in a non-humble way, it is, it's not a new thing for American Christians. It's not a new thing for Christians. It's been around forever. It's, there's nothing new for us as followers of Jesus. I, I want to share with you a passage where we see this on display. It's, it's so interesting. But friends, this is what we need to know this year, when you come to the word of God, it's not for information. It's for transformation. And transformation cannot take place unless you humble yourself and read it and then discipline yourself in doing it. Mark chapter 10, this great interaction, I'm sure you've, you've, heard this before. But James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we, listen, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Yeah. 
I tell you what, I've heard, I've heard, never mind, let's just move on. Okay. All right. Okay. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. They replied, well, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. Now, hang on a second. They have gazed upon Jesus. They have walked with Jesus. They have heard Jesus teach. They've heard Jesus just, I, I, they, they, and they, they've got to hang out with him. So they were, they were with the flesh, Jesus. And they were leveraging him for their own good. We, we, do the, we can do the same if we don't have humility. So he says, listen, Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Now look, with, they don't miss a beat. We can. Yes, they're thinking, hey, this is working. He's buying this. We can. And Jesus said to them, you will. You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized, I am baptized with. And so this is Jesus letting them know this isn't about a real baptism. This is about they're going to be baptized into suffering. They're going to be baptized into enduring incredible pain. And you're going to die because of me. You're right. You're going to be identified with me in this baptism of suffering, in this baptism of ultimate death, martyrdom. But the sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, now, now listen, when the ten heard about this, <laughs> they, they get wind. Either they caught, I, I, I don't know how they heard about it, but somebody told them maybe they were there. I don't know. But look, they became in, indignant. Why? Because they wanted to sit on the right and the left. Why else would they get upset? Dang it. They asked before I was going to. They became indignant with James and John. And then Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Look what he says. Not so with you. Not so. These, these, are, the tw these are the disciples. They're going to preach the gospel around them. We're here today because they preach the gospel. That's wild. That's crazy. And they were going to have authority. They were going to, they, they were going to have churches under them. They were going to lead God's people and Jesus needed to set something straight. Hey, listen, listen, don't you leverage me to sit on the right and the left. Uh-uh. The Gentiles do that. Those who don't know God do that. Humanity does that. Not so with you. You're different because I'm different. Say this with me. Not so with you. Now lay your hand on your chest. And say, we're going to say, not so with me. You ready? Not so with me. You're not going to demand. You better respect me. You're not going to say, don't you know who I am? I walked with Jesus. You're not going to walk into a town and preach the gospel and use the gospel for you to prop your name up. No, 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 no. Not so. From my kingdom. What is he talking about there? Humility. And so he knows that their heart is, yes, but how do you become great? How do you become big? How do you get on the left and the right? How do you do this? Because that's what we want. Jesus says, well, listen, instead, whoever wants to become great among you, must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first 
must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Training, exercising, disciplining yourself to be like Christ. Training for Christ's likeness is to allow the scriptures as you come to them to reveal the things you need to do. And humility helps you to do the things you don't want to do or to not do the things that you are doing. Training for Christ's likeness is intentional. It's a discipline. It's a discipline. It's the the dying to self. Dying to the emotion that you feel. Not acting on it. Not saying it. Not responding that way. Not putting yourself. Like Jesus said, come to me. I'm the man. No, come to me. I am humble. It's not putting yourself in the center of your own universe where everybody's action is, they better consider how that makes me feel, how that makes me want, how that makes me feel. No, 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 no. Humble says, how do I make them feel? Training. Exercising. And just like training for any kind of sport, just like training for anything, it's hard in the beginning. It's hard to run that first mile if you're not running. It's hard. It's hard to go to the gym. It's hard. You don't, you don't wake up and go, boy, I can't wait to hit the gym the first day you've ever gone. And then after you're there, you're like, this is the stupidest decision I've ever made in my life. <laughs> but, you, but the next day, now the reality is there, the next day to do it again, oh, you do it anyway. You grit your teeth and you show up. And what, what was hard in the beginning as you discipline and train and exercise, as you keep showing up, as you keep doing it, it becomes easier. This is what Paul's talking about. If normally you would respond to someone, well, let me just tell you something. You go, mm -mm, mm -mm, no, mm -mm, mm -mm. not going to do it. Train yourself. Come to the word. Is that humble? Am I becoming like Christ? Is that Christ's likeness? And then you're like, oh God, I need your help. He goes, I'm here, to, I'm here to help you. But I want you to exercise the muscle of denying yourself. It's the no muscle and the yes muscle. That we don't say no to attitudes. We don't say no to what's about to come out of our mouth. We don't say no to the aggravation in our spirit. And instead of seeing the person as they don't deserve this, Christ would not treat them this way, we just let it fly. And then we justify it. That's arrogant. That's pride. That's not humility. According to the Bible, what helps us grow spiritually is humility. What will help you receive everything that God has for you is humility. Now, look, look at what Peter says. He says, be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It doesn't say pray that God would humble you. It says humble yourself. 
That's the key to growth. As you know, friends, now, and just hear me, if you've been around church for any longer than, than, than two minutes, you're going to know that spiritual growth and maturity is not directly connected to the time that you've known God. It's not. There are some believers who've been walking with God for five years and are much more mature than someone who's walked with God for 50. Why? Humility. Humility. And humility causes your spiritual growth. The Word of God, as we come to it with humility, latches on to us. As we submit to it, begins to transform us. As we say, oh, I don't want to do that, but I'm going to humble myself and do it. Godliness is not what is on display. It is, it's what's in the heart. Your attitude, your spirit. Your desire to be seen or desire for Jesus to be seen. Your desire to be respected or your desire to respect others. Your desire to be honored, you better honor me. Or your desire to give honor to others. Your desire to fight for, well, you don't know how gifted I am. If you really knew, by golly, I'd be preaching up there. Or, Lord, I just want to serve you wherever you give me the opportunity. Pride looks for every tone that they can get offended with and every word, and it, but humility considers not how I feel. How can I make them feel loved? Pride puts us at the center of everything. When we come to the word, it's all about me. When we come to, work, to, to church, it's about me. When, we, when we, we're in, in conversations with it, it's about me. Humility says, Jesus, it's about you. That is what godliness is, Christ-likeness. Psalm 138, though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distant, distance from the proud. If your number one purpose in your life every day is to make sure you're not taken advantage of, friend, you are in, in arrogance. If you walk around with a chip on your shoulder and any Slight breeze can set you off. Friend, you are riddled with arrogance. And it's time you humble yourself. Humble yourself. Discipline, train, exercise. Do what it takes. This, this idea, though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. This is, it's not a warning. Though you, it can be, you can, you can see that, but it's more of an invitation to be with God and feel the care of God. Because pride says, no, you better meet my needs. You better be, you better now, you meet my needs. Okay, you did, I love you now. Humility says, God, you meet my needs. You care for me. Why do some grow spiritually more than others? Because God is invited into every area of their life through the doorway of their discipline, their training in humility. Listen to the words of God in Isaiah 57, 15. I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. This is a big deal, friends. So what does it mean to pursue, to exercise, to train, to discipline yourself in godliness? 
Paul talks about it again in Philippians 2. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God. Wow. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, everybody say instead. He gave up his divine privileges. He gave up his privileges. Privileges to be right. Privileges to be the judge. Privileges to be worshipped. Privileges. He, 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 he let them go. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, 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 he humbled himself. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor. Friends, train thyself in humility. Before you send that email, ask, is this because I feel something or is it because it's right? Before you shoot that word out of your mouth because your spouse annoys you, is this about me or is this about being Christ-like? As you come to the word, you let it be what you say, Lord, I want to be like this. And you humble yourself. Discipline yourself in Christ-like humility. When you feel your pride saying, defend yourself, deny it. When it says, when your pride says, don't apologize, whatever. They're doing this. They did this. Well, they apologize first, then I'll apologize. Apologize. When you feel your will stiffen to resist being wrong, humble yourself. When you come to the word, do it with the attitude of humility. Lord, whatever your word says, I want to do it. I recognize that I am proud and arrogant and strong-willed. I recognize, I recognize it in my relationships. I recognize it that I put myself at the center of everybody's words and feelings and how they walk in rooms and how they speak and how they, it's just all about me, it's all about me, everything's about me, but God, I'm sorry. I'm arrogant and I repent and I humble myself because I want everything you have for me. Let's pray. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I'm yours. Lord, I am in need of you. I am proud. I am, I am self-centered. And I humble myself and repent and confess. And I ask you to give me the grace to cooperate with being, becoming, training, exercising in humility. That as I engage with your word, 
It's so that I can become more like you. For the purpose of godliness. Lord, we sense your conviction, your loving conviction. And it is an invitation to humble yourself, for us to humble ourselves before you. So, Lord, we say yes to you today. And we make a decision that we're going to train. We're going to do the things that aren't easy. We're going to not do the things that come natural. We're going to not do them. And we're going to show up. We're going to show up at the gymnasium of humility. And we're going to work on it. We're going to cooperate. And we're going to. We're going to actually have peace. Because humility allows my emotions to be at rest. We're actually going to have real conversations because humility doesn't shoot sharp and hard and defend. It's like you, Jesus. It loves. Lord, we're going to receive the transformational power of your word because we're going to acknowledge where we are shy and where we need some help that we can call on your name and you're going to help us as we cooperate with you in godliness. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your spirit and your power. I pray that you would minister to us today. Continue to stretch us to becoming like you. We are not worthy, but the fact that your word invites us to become like you means we can. And so we humble ourselves to that and we say yes in Jesus' name. Just remain with your heads bowed today. If you're here today and you can sense the Holy Spirit identifying you, you know that you are not saved, that you have not placed Jesus at the center of your life, and you would like to acknowledge today that you're going to do that, and you want to give your life to him, and you want to submit to him, you want to humble yourself before him so you can receive all the blessings he has for you. If that's you today, nobody's looking around, can you just raise your hand right where you are, just lift it up right now to acknowledge, just hold it up. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just wave it at me. Thank you. God bless you. Put your hands down. Bless you. Thank you. I'm going to just lead you in a prayer that just comes into verbal alignment with what God is doing in your life right now. And we're all going to pray it together. Say, Lord Jesus, I humble myself. I give you my life. I come into alignment with what you've done for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for raising from the dead for me. Thank you for revealing to me that I don't know you. And so I say yes to you. And I give you my life. It belongs to you. From this day forward, I'm going to discipline myself through the word of God and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a hand today? If you gave your life to Jesus today, there's a QR code right on the back of your seat there. Just snap a picture of that. It'll take you to, uh, to a link that will have some information for you to, to fill out, not for the sake of us contacting you, it's for the sake of us 
letting you know how we want to help you to move forward in this decision you've made. We are honored to do that. So let's all stand to our feet. I'm grateful for you. I love you. The greatest honor of my life is to be able to teach the Word of God to you. So many, so many of you. I am, I look up to you. I am honored to be your pastor. So thank you for allowing me to teach the Word. If we can, just lift your hands to the Lord. I'd love to pray a prayer of blessing over your life. Father, in Jesus' name, move in your people's lives. Bring to them your purposes and your plans. Today, as they leave, may they know that you, your spirit dwells in them, that you are guiding them, that you are with them. Let the, those who are going through difficult times know that you are close to them. Those who are experiencing your blessing, may they know that it is from you. And Lord, may you go before us and open doors that only you can open. May you bring things into our pathway that are obviously from you. May you restore our relationships. May you heal our corrupted hearts from the world. And may you bring peace to us on all fronts of our life. May we leave here knowing that you love us incredibly, incredibly much. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.